7 o'clock. We have two sets of minutes to look at tonight. <clears throat> the first is January 7th, 2020. I'm looking for a motion. I'd move to approve the minutes of January 7, 2020 with any amendments or additions thereto. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> Page one. <clears throat> Page two. And page three. <clears throat> uh, two things under um, number 11, town manager's report. Uh, the first one, the second bullet down, it reads common level appraisal report from the state. And it says will not be appealed. And I wonder if it should say should not be appealed per the advice of the uh, <coughs> assessor Henman. Uh, I think we agreed that it won't be appealed, so. Right, it's just, that was our recommend. That was the recommendation. So the recommendation is you shouldn't, as opposed to you will. Um, I don't know. It's just it, not a big deal. I just picked up on it. The, the next one is maybe a little bit more important, and sure. it's under the last bullet, which is a uh, letter of resignation from the town manager. And shouldn't that reflect that the select board said no? Second. <laughs> 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 uh, probably not. I guess not. <laughs> Anything else on page three? Hearing nothing. All those in favor of approving the minutes of January 7th, 2020, say aye. 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 Any opposed? And <clears throat> no abstentions. And we have the minutes of January 14th, 2020. Is there a motion? I'd move to approve the minutes of January 14th, 2020, with any amendments <clears throat> or additions thereto. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> Pardon me, page one. And page two. Hearing no changes offered, all those in favor of approving the minutes of January 14th, 2020, say aye. 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 Any opposed? And no abstentions. <clears throat> time for public comment. If anyone in the audience has any issues to bring up, either on the agenda or not on the agenda, this is your time. And see no hands raised. We'll move on to item number four in the Champlain Water District report. Joe Duncan, our general manager and citizen of Williston is here. All right. Hi, thanks if you'd introduce. Yes. Uh, so um, Joe Duncan, general manager of Champlain Water District. Hello, everybody. President Wilston as well, thank you very much for your service. Um, Liz Royer is your commissioner rep from the town of Williston. She uh, was planning to be here this evening, but unfortunately had a, uh, a sick kid, so she is not able to be here. Otherwise, she'd be uh, presenting on this <coughs> as well. But with me tonight is uh, Nate Peon. He is our chief engineer, director of projects and programs at Champlain Water District. Also a future resident of Williston, Essentially on January 31st when he closes. Oh, yeah. so, All goes well. Out of Williston connection. <clears throat> so what I wanted to do this evening is just to give you a quick update on two items. Um, one is where we are at with our proposed fiscal year 2021 budget, as well as give you some information on the upcoming bond vote that we have on town meeting. So. And I'm also I'm happy to discuss anything else that you have for questions of us. I'll try and keep it brief uh, and let you guys do uh, ask any questions that you have. So as far as our FY 2021 budget goes, 
we are looking at a $8.4 million budget. That's about a $300,000 increase over, last, over the, the current budget that we are in. Uh, that represents uh, going from our current wholesale rate of $2.23 per thousand gallons that we charge to our wholesale uh, municipal users from 2.23 to 2.313 per thousand gallons. That represents a 8.3 cents per thousand gallons increase. And what we try to do is look at that on a uh, typical family. A typical family uses about 65,700 gallons a year. So that represents about a $5.45 increase per year to a uh, typical family, which amounts to about a 45 cent per month increase for the typical family. So we've tried to keep that in mind over the years as, as we've developed our budgets. Um, keep ourselves <laughs> sustainable as we move forward. Uh, in a percentage base, that represent about a 3.75% increase uh, all together. So I've, there's a lot of information in here. I won't go through it all with you, but I will let you know that uh, uh, there's some charts in here. Our, uh, our revenue is primarily through water sales, and the water sales are, are our sales to each of the 12 municipal water systems that we wholesale water to, the town of Williston being one of them. Uh, of our budget, a lot of, the majority of it, about 75%, is out of our operations. We have some debt service that represents about 13%, and I bring that up because we'll talk a little bit about that when, we, when I talk about the bonds. Um, the rest is minor amount in water supply fees. <laughs> of the 75% in operations, about uh, a third of that is salaries, 20% uh, is, is, uh, is maintenance, uh, another 15% in, in benefits, and then uh, another 25% in uh, treatment supplies and, and you, electric utilities. So everything's kind of split uh, in, in that regard as far as our operations are concerned. Um, there's a chart in here on our historical water rates, and as you can see, we've, we've historically uh, held the rate way back when. We held the rate from the 90s through the 2000s, and I think that was very problematic because uh, we wound up having a couple big hits as, as we went along and realized that we weren't being sustainable with our rates. So now we're trying to look at somewhere in the 3 to 4% increase per year to try and keep up with inflation also tightening our belts a little bit, but then also focusing and allowing us to focus on long-term maintenance. That's a real uh, focus of ours these days is managing our assets and making sure that we have enough funds to, to uh, put ourselves in a position where we're not reacting to problematic uh, surprises, but putting our money into the things that we know will eventually age, <laughs> trying to get out ahead of that. So, one of the things that we usually do is give a comparative summary of retail rates. So each community charges its consumers a, uh, a rate. And so as a uh, homeowner in, in Williston, that is, uh, that is made up of what the town purchases <clears throat> from us, plus whatever operations costs the town has um, through its own operations, through its own water department. Whatever debt you may have from your water department, whatever uh, operations force you may have for uh, employees on that and that all makes up the addition of our 2.23 so <laughs> Williston is about middle of the pack in in the county for rates our wholesale rate currently at 2.23 um, Williston's effective rate is about 5.37 and the range in the county is anywhere from four dollars and nine cents in South Burlington to about six dollars and sixty five cents per thousand Wilston has, has done a very nice job as well over the years of, of keeping their rates, um, in our opinion, sustainable as well. You'll see a chart of annual water sales in here. We, we had a spike in the, early, um, in the uh, early 2000s and then a quick downturn, uh, and that was related to IBM and the economic downturn that we, we had there. Things have since generally stabilized, and uh, we're, we sit somewhere around uh, 9.5 to 9.8 million gallons a day on average over the past few years. And that's generally been fluctuating a little bit with the weather. Last year was a very hot year. We had a, a lot of uh, water sales over the summer. So that's, that's where we might get up to closer to 9.9 .9 compared to the, the 9.5 that we sometimes average around. 
The uh, last thing I'll point out is our debt service. There's a history of and, and projected annual debt service chart in here. And what's important with that as I transition to the, um, to the bond vote is what we've been trying to do and what the board is, has directed us to do is as debt service falls off to try and maintain a level debt service by reinvesting in our system. And so what you'll see is, is that in, um, in, in 2020, we had some debt service fall off and we backfilled that debt service um, in 2021 with projects such as the, the, uh, the Williston tank project, as well as a uh, project at our filter water tank. So in 2021, we'll be start to repay those. So that'll backfill from 2020 to 2021. In 2023, we have another drop off. Uh, the projects that we're planning to construct as part of these bonds coming up will come due in the 2023 timeframe. And that's when we will backfill that debt to bring us back up to around 890,000 debt. So the important thing here is we've been trying to reinvest in our infrastructure as debt service falls off. And in doing that, we wind up with a net neutral impact on the ratepayers. So the projects that we're looking to bond, and I'll talk a little bit about in a second, in March uh, will ultimately not cost the ratepayers uh, a rate increase to our ratepayers as a result of the projects we're proposing. And in our opinion, it's actually a real benefit because it's infrastructure that we need to improve to provide a benefit to our, uh, to our regional <coughs> supply. So um, we think that's a prudent way to go about it. So that's the information that I have for you on our FY2021 20, proposed budget. I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to talk about the bond and then answer questions, whatever you prefer. Uh, let's see if there's any questions right now before we talk about the bond. Well, the standard question, Joe, are the <coughs> drivers in, uh, in that cost, uh, whatever, wholesale price increase of, what, 3.7%, 3.75%? Yeah. The, the major drivers are our are, are salaries and benefits. So there's, we are unionized and we have a, uh, we have a, we have a fixed uh, rate increase in there, as well as the increase in, in uh, services that are um, cost us for health care, as well as retirement benefits. And then the other one is our electrical costs and the increase in treatment chemicals. And the treatment chemicals are actually a really big one that we're trying to look at how we, every year we shop those around to try and find the best price. And one of the things that it's really struggling, we're struggling with right now is that there's a limited number of suppliers that supply the quality of chemicals that we're looking for. We've gone down the path before of accepting some lower, what we, some lower prices in hopes that their quality would be what we needed to be, and it wasn't. Um, and a lot of those suppliers that we rely on are actually out of state. We've got one in Mississippi. We've got another in Pennsylvania. And the increased costs associated with, um, with carriers is really, you're seeing that a lot in the chemical prices because there's a, there's a shortage of drivers, and, uh, and that has driven the cost up for the chemicals. Thank you. Any further questions? If not, let's do the bond. Okay. So on, uh, on town meeting day, on March 3rd, it'll be an Australian ballot item. We have one <laughs> article that is, that'll be on the ballot. It'll be on the, uh, the towns, along with all the other articles on the town ballot. And what <clears throat> we are looking for is one article to approve two projects. And those two projects are our Essex West pump station project and our Colchester South Tank loop project. And both of those, they, they probably sound like they're very town specific projects. Colchester, you hear the word Colchester and you hear the word Essex. Um, but the reality is, is we are a, uh, a regional supplier and when we take on projects, we take them on to improve the, our transmission system as a whole. So, the Essex West pump station, there's uh, right now the town of Essex receives water from the village of Essex Junction area to pump out to the uh, 289 uh, section of, of uh, in the Essex outlet area. 
as well as out towards Jericho and then over to Jericho. We do that through one pump station. So we're looking to add a second pump station on the west side of, of Essex to allow us to have some redundancy to feed those areas. But there's also another challenge for us in that there's one tank located on the west side of Essex, call our Essex West Tank, oddly enough. And that tank is very, it's 2.2 million gallons. It's, it's only uh, 15 feet high and a couple hundred feet wide. So we have a really hard time turning that water over in that tank. And what happens is it drives our whole hydraulic gradient for getting water out from Colchester and Winooski uh, through Essex and, um, and through South Burlington. So what we're looking to do is to put that pump station in and have that pump station be able to ease the hydraulic gradient that we're required right now in order to, we have to really vary our hydraulic gradient across what we call our, our high service area. So everything that comes out of the plant pretty much can serve Colchester, Winooski, um, Essex, Williston, and, um, and South Burlington. And so that Essex tank really drives, Essex West tank drives how we have to pump water throughout our system. So taking, uh, putting a pump station on there that allows us to turn the water over without having to um, manipulate our, our system from the plant really allows us to move water more efficiently throughout our, our transmission system. So it's actually a system-wide benefit to put that tank in. Granted, Essex also benefits from it because it now has a second feed into their, um, into their uh, service area by the Essex outlets. So that's the idea behind that project. That project is a $2.6 million project. So we're looking at a $3.5 million total bond. So of that $3.5 million, 2.6 is represented by the Essex West Pump Station project. The second project is our Colchester South Tank Loop project. Colchester South Tank Loop uh, is also, <coughs> the Colchester South tanks are the Water Tower Hill tanks. So if you're ever driving uh, out by exit 16, there's two blue tanks at the top of the hill. Those are our Colchester South tanks. Those tanks service Winooski, uh, Colchester Town Water System, Mounds Bay Water Company System, Colchester Fire District Number 3, and also the Town of Essex in the Fort Ethan Allen and Susie Wilson areas. And right now, we have one line that feeds that, that tank through uh, Camp Johnson. And our goal is to add a second uh, line in there to give us redundancy for getting water both in and out of that tank uh, and relieving the, uh, the issue of relying on only one feed. The other thing that this also benefits is there is a, uh, there's some AC lines, asbestos cement lines, within the um, Hercules Drive and Orion area down by Costco and Baker Distributing down in that area. And there's some dead end lines. And because of that AC pipe, it does have some vinyl lining in it that has deteriorated over time. And because of the dead ends, we do see some uh, tetrachloroethylene spikes uh, above the five uh, parts per billion limit mm -hmm. for the uh, state. So having a loop put in there Eliminating those dead ends also eliminates that potential PCE issue as well. So um, while that project does provide a benefit to the Colchester town system by eliminating the PCE, we get a, a strong benefit that, mul that uh, helps out multiple communities by having redundancy to our Colchester South tanks. That project <coughs> is a $900,000 project combined with the $2.6 million for Essex West pump station, bringing it to 3.5. And as I mentioned, this, we're looking to secure a drinking water SRF loan for both of these projects. And in doing so, and the construction timelines are building these in the 2021 summer, we would be looking at debt service coming into, um, into effect during our FY23 budget when our debt service is falling off. And therefore, as I mentioned before, I <coughs> back to our ratepayers as a result of adding $3.5 million in debt. One of the things we're also hopeful for is um, the state is, is offering a subsidy with the drinking water SRF. We're not guaranteed to get it, but there's a potential for another 25% loan forgiveness associated with that SRF project. So passing the, passing the uh, bonds now and constructing it in 2021 should set us up to be able to receive some of that subsidy because it's first come, first serve as of October 1st of, uh, of 2020. We're planning on it not 
and we've we basically have set ourselves up uh, on the most conservative. So it's only it actually becomes better than net neutral if we wind up getting any of that subsidy. One thing <coughs> with the uh, Colchester South Tank Loop too that some of that project cost is shared with the Colchester Town Water System as well. That's true. Yeah. Um, so it's a forty one percent split for. 41% on CWD and then 59% on Colchester Town Water System. As uh, Colchester Town Water System is covering the preliminary engineering and final design, and then we're splitting the construction 50 50. So that's where the percentages come out. It's 41% CWD, 59% Colchester Town. That's very similar to what we did with the, the Williston North Tank project. Thank you. Uh, questions for. Uh Joe on this <clears throat> it's probably not important but what does hydraulic radiant mean uh, the hydraulic radiant is I'm, I'm sorry <laughs> yeah no no problem yeah you know, you get, uh, so the if you think about it it's it's basically how how hard you have to push the water so you know in a, in a, in a perfect world everything flows by gravity from some high point down to you as a user well in order to get it to that high point in the tank you have to pump it up to there so there's a there's an energy requirement to get it up to there. So that's the hydraulic gradient is that delta that you have to lift the water to to get it to the tank level that you then want to have to come down. And so <coughs> the, the higher it is, the more energy it takes. And so if we're able to get the Essex West tank to turn itself over with the, with the pumps, we don't have that hydraulic gradient pushing against the rest of the, the, rest of the system because a low and fat tank it has it has more gallons per foot and because of its diameter and so if you have a if you have a taller tank with less width and you're drawing the same amount of water out of it that one will go quicker the one that has less gallons per foot than the one that has more gallons per foot so it won't drain as fast and so because it's not draining it fast it keeps the gradient high whereas a tank that's draining fast it keeps the gradient at low so we're always have to push out to accommodate the Essex West tank and if we get the Essex West tank to, to fall faster by pumping out of it into Essex town, we can get the tanks to operate on the same level. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? I have a couple. Oh, Rick, yes. <laughs> so you, you mentioned that the, um, the, the split was similar to Wilson. Do you, was it, Williston was a 50-50 split. I don't remember the numbers, so I... Williston, yeah, Williston was a 50-50 split on the tank costs, and the town owned the water line up to it, so the right. town paid right. the extra for the water line. <laughs> right. And so what Nate is saying, it's a 50-50 split for the construction cost, but they're responsible for the preliminary engineering and the design, which was similar to how Williston was done. And so Williston... And it surely, uh, the um, head, yeah, it. it was uh, boy, was it like 54, 55, 45, I think, something like that. Yeah. So it's not too far off yeah. from that. Uh, so then, um, I understand that, but in the other project, uh, is there no cost sharing with the uh, town of Essex? No, it's not because we are responsible for we're responsible for the pumping, similar to Williston, where we own the two pump stations. For Williston, um, this although this does benefit them by providing a redundant feed, they don't they don't need it. Although they you know they do, but it's not something that is it's something that benefits them, but wasn't something that they necessarily needed. Whereas we need it to turn that tank over, so there wasn't a, a cost sharing element. We are actually bringing it and tying it in. There almost was a cost sharing because there was a thought that they were going to extend their extend the water main some, but uh, we brought it to the closest point of <coughs> their system and tied it in, and that's where we end. I have a, a final <coughs> question. You said that this is going to be part of the um, uh, town's... Uh, it'll, be, it'll be on the ballot. On the ballot. So I, uh, I want to just clarify, you don't mean that it'll be on the town meeting, the town's town meeting warning process? Okay. No, correct. Yeah, there'll be a separate warning right. for it, but when people walk up to and receive their ballots, this article will be one of the articles on the ballots that they receive at the at the voter okay. poll. Do those ballots then go somewhere else to be counted? No, the way because of electro, I call it electronic balloting. Uh, the because of the fact that everything is counted, 
electronically these days. We used to do it separately yeah. where the, we would have hand counting of our ballots. And uh, I think it was 2016 when, when we had our last bond and uh, Karen Richard, who was one of our board members, got the clerks together and said, is there any reason we can't have them also on the, <coughs> on the ballot so that there's electronic counting? So, so just report the results from each yes. community to you and then you combine them all into one, correct? correct. Yep, correct. So how does that work, Joe? Because not all, all parts of all towns are part of the Champlain Water District. So, so any, there's 12 water systems within eight CWD communities. And we have one, one board member per, per community, even <laughs> though one community may have more than one water system. That's Colchester as an example. Um, and so you actually, don't have to be on the water system in the town of Colchester to vote. Similar to Williston, where you may be a resident who's not on the water system, but you have the uh, right to vote. So that's the case yeah. for for each of our. Interesting. Community. Yeah. So okay. Well, um, two questions. Um, so if the bond vote were to fail, you know, hypothetically, what would I mean? First of all, what would you do, and what would be the repercussions of that? So what we would do is the, the Colchester South Tank Loop is the more the priority than the Essex West. And obviously that's the lower cost of the two is the 900,000 versus the 2.6. So a couple different potential options are we take a look at the, we take a look at the um, Essex West project and see if there's anything we can change. The, the Colchester South Tank Loop is pretty bare bones. It's a, it's a point A to point B water line and we need a, 12 inch main hydraulically so there's not much to change there yeah. so we would look to re-vote the bond either with a change in the Essex West project or dropping the Essex West project altogether okay and um, the um, uh, <clears throat> the chart you gave us that shows projected uh, his historical and projected annual debt for the his the projected does the debt um, that's being shown include <clears throat> the amount that the Colchester South Tank Loop will be financed by the town of Colchester. In other words, it yes. doesn't assume that the district is taking all that cost on. You are correct. Yeah, it, uh, if you do happen to have a colored version of the annual debt service, we don't. The, <laughs> the, there's a little tiny. There's a big. There's a bigger line over the 893 that. Uh, <laughs> under 2023 yep. that represents the 2.6 million for the Essex West pump station then what you see is another smaller line underneath there okay. that represents the 41 percent of our 900,000 for the Colchester South tank okay. project okay so you're si in similar to uh, we carry the we carry the overall debt on paper but right. we we reduce it based upon what we're getting yeah. for um, revenue from right, the Colchester, Colchester case, yeah. which is similar to what we did with the Williston yeah. North Tank. We're, the re we're responsible for the entire debt service, but we're receiving 55% right. payments from the Same thing with any forgiveness that you haven't taken into account. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Any further questions? And if not, thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you very much. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you. <clears throat> <laughs> so our next presentation, Sarah Reeves is not here yet, uh, so she's let's... She's not going to be here. She's not going to be There's been a change in plans. Ah, uh, okay. Oh. So we're not doing this tonight? Uh, the, yes. Or are we? Eric has the story on it, but I guess something's come up and they weren't able to be yeah, here. Yeah, Sarah had something come up today. Um, her Thank you. She has to reschedule, so we'll have that back in February. All right. Um, we we prefer that you took the sidewalk thing later, so if yes. you could do something other than that, Re perhaps the audit report. A regional Unified Planning Work Program. You could do that too. Wait, that's sure. wait. so oh, yeah, that's next. I'm sorry, we're having trouble is here. Rescheduling. Right? So we're not going to be discussing this that. tonight. No. Okay. It looks like we're going to have them on at your next meeting, February 4th. Okay, and it looks like they've pretty much selected Williston. They've narrowed it down. I don't know if yeah. finalize the slides. Okay. Um, I wonder, is the audit report going to take half an hour? No. No.
well, let's do that anyway, and uh, we'll come back and do the uh, regional unified planning if we have time before we do the public hearing. <clears throat> so we're going on to the audit? Yes, report. item number nine. Is, and half hour, I might put you to sleep. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to start by just um, highlighting a few things in the memo that you received. So um, to begin with, you normally would have a final audited financial statement right now, but um, just my being new and working <coughs> through the books of the town, um, we pushed back the field work of the audit and then a couple of big projects. So <coughs> this is a draft. Um, I've made some changes and sent them back to the auditors and it's still in their second partner review, but by the end of the month, we will have a final um, audit report. And you'll have a copy of that. Um, this year we don't have a single audit. We just, I think we ended up like 732,000, so we just squeaked below the 750. Um, yeah. What is, what is, do you mind if I interrupt? Uh, sure. What is meant by a single audit? It is an audit over any of your federal government grant funds. So they have very specific um, audit steps they have to take over each of the different types of grants and they have to select, they select a sample of all those grants to figure out what they want to test and it's detailed testing of your expenditures. So, but it's only over your Fed. So it's the audit and then more on the grants. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, in the governance letter, the most important thing there is all significant transactions um, there is a little piece about the four adjustments that were not recorded. And um, <clears throat> during their field work and discussions with um, the auditors, they were just in, not material to the financial statements and we were both beyond a point of wanting to go back and take more time, so we agreed just to pass on those adjustments. Um, no disagreements with management. Um, Let's see, I'm gonna hop down to the um, financial statements themselves, <clears throat> that little paragraph. And just to explain, um, I actually hadn't worked with modified accrual accounting before myself, so I did a little research. But I just wanted to talk about the difference between, we have two sets of statements in these financials. One is full accrual accounting, where you record all your fixed assets as, as assets um, on your balance sheet and you record depreciation expense, um, you record all the debt on the financial statements and the debt payments are not an expense, but they reduce the liability. So those are the major things. And then the pension plan. We don't account for the pension plan. So those are the major differences between what you see when I'm presenting financial statements, when we do the budget, modified accrual. And in the financials, we have modified accrual and then we have the fully accrued financial statements. So that's the two pieces of the financials that are in this packet. Um, and unless you have questions on the things between, I mean, I'm, I'm skipping a couple things because they're um, fairly obvious and you've read it. And then um, I'm going down to in the internal controls report. Um, the audit did not identify any deficiencies in the internal controls nor any instances, instances of non-compliance, um, which is a really good thing. And now I want to take you in the audited financials, if you go to page 25 for a minute. And we talked about this, I think, for a minute last week. So I'm looking at page 25. It's Schedule F. And I'm looking at the three lines from the bottom. And it's net change in fund balance. So if you look at the middle column called Final Budget, we anticipated spending fund balance to the tune of 875000 we actually only spent fund balance to the tune of 300,000. Um, the biggest um, reason for that difference is our um, local options tax was 384,000 greater than budget. That represented 67% <coughs> of that favorable variance. And there's some other things in there, but everything else is small in comparison to that one number. Um, and that was all I had. So, other than questions from you. And are there questions? <clears throat> it, it appears to me that it's a clean report. It is. Uh, which is always good. Yes, yeah. yep. <clears throat> so, Shirley, I'll be honest. I am always left 
completely in left field when it comes <laughs> to this report. Um, usually somebody else is a little better than me, and, and I, but I think the key things that I'm picking up on is that there, and I'm only quoting, don't, these aren't my words, I'm only quoting from what I see in yep. the um, memo that um, you put together is four missteps, but that those four missteps <clears throat> were deemed immaterial. So they're very minor. Yep. So I'm yep. guessing what I'm saying yep. is that I'm seconding Terry's comment of this is a very clean report. Right. They don't, not booking those does not materially <coughs> state the financial statements. Okay. So do you do taxes on the side? <laughs> Pardon me? My family. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Any other questions for Shirley? No, thank you. I mean. Well, and Jeff, um, you made your comment about the financials. As I said, it was my first time working through these. It, it, it took me a long time to work my way through the different schedules and follow it and understand it. So, and I, and I still have some more to do and some more work with the auditors, okay. but, but um, <clears throat> certainly made more sense than the first time yeah. I looked at them. So then congratulations on surviving it. And, um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, you know, without any problems, or I should, that didn't come out right, without any apparent problems. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we'll move back then to the Regional Unified Planning and Work Program list. And Eric, I think you're talking about. Yep. Um, so, recap the Unified Planning Work Program is <laughs> developed by the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission each year. Um, the CCRPC receives local, state, and federal funds from a variety of sources that are used for various planning programs. And the UPWP committee decides how these funds are allocated. Um, this, this plan is updated annually and requests are taken from municipalities on how public funds should be invested towards transportation and other planning programs in, in Chittenden County. So they're preparing this for FY21 right now. <coughs> we'll consider these in the coming months. Include with your packet, um, the request of the board this year, we combined the planning and public works requests into one document to, to look at. And uh, planning director Matt Belange prepared this, this packet for you today. So in, in his memo, he, he summarizes each of the projects, and then we've uh, included the, the summary application sheets within the packet if you had any uh, questions as you were reading this. Um, one thing I will point out with uh, talking to Matt at the end of last week, he had a conversation with the CCRPC, and uh, as you recall, in the budget discussions last week, the funds were put in for the um, form-based code study. And Matt learned from the CCRPC that um, this may be eligible for UPWP funds um, due to the transportation component of it with the grid streets discussion. So Matt's proposed in the UPWP um, to use the $50,000 allocated in FY21 towards doing the whole study in one year if the CCRPC will pick up the rest of the amount for that. And knowing in his research that the $100,000 maybe a leaner number. He, he's proposed a $125,000 project with UPWP funds than using the $50,000 as a 40% match in the application. Um, the, the positive takeaways from this are if it's funded, the town wouldn't have to pay $100,000 for it and it be all complete in one year. Yeah. So um, Matt's proposed this for, for review by the CCRPC um, if the board supports this. And then he is also planning, has projects in here for an official map and mode shift facility projects. We had these in this current um, FY20 UPWP, and we heard were at the end of last week as well that when they did their review, they have some funds allocated this year for these projects, but it's recommended to also um, have them in the, the FY21 at UPWP as well in case there's additional work to be done. So I touched base with Matt on that today, and he he advises that we keep these in the plan as well. Um, on the public work side, uh, Lisa prepared those documents, and uh, I don't have a lot of additional details to share, but I could definitely uh, dig in if you have any additional questions here. But, but with the action for the board requested tonight is to support these projects with a motion, and we'll, we'll inform the CCRPC accordingly. Thank you. Uh, questions from the board regarding the projects? Eric, do you know what the um, sort of, for lack of better words, or maybe it's not the best word, the process that um, 
Matt and Bruce and Lisa use when outlining or determining what projects should be recommended? <clears throat> I'm not sure exactly how they internally in their departments, but I know they have a number of projects that are forecasted out for a number of years and they can think what may be eligible for some of this grant funding and then prioritizing what's kind of a shorter term project to accomplish than looking to see if these funds can be activated. Certainly not meant as a disagreement. It's just, it would just be helpful for me to know, you know, what that, I, I mean, if you could get that to me, fine. It's not going to affect how I vote tonight. Um, the one that was, I thought was a little bit surprising was the traffic count request. But I'm guessing that's because it's actually the um, the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission that provides the staff that does the, the counts. Yes, that's correct. I, yeah. I know they usually, uh, I think interns. Um, Something the along those lines during the summer. The and those may not be the exact traffic counts we actually end up requesting. It's the concept of would have four, mm -hmm. I think might be what's important there. Okay. Other questions? <clears throat> there is a suggested motion to, to approve these. <clears throat> Move to approve the projects proposed for inclusion in the Regional Annual Unified Planning Work Program for fiscal year 2020. Second. <clears throat> Sorry, for discussion on the motion. Bruce just showed up. I don't know if it's worth getting an answer from him or? Yeah, sure, why don't you? Uh, Real quickly, Bruce, I asked Eric, uh, what was the process you, Matt, and Lisa used uh, for coming up <laughs> with the projects that are recommended to be included in the UPWP? Uh, I can't speak for Matt. Okay. But for public works, there are requests that we get from people during the course of the year for different things, most of them. The only other one I believe is the, isn't there one there for a sidewalk? Yes. Sidewalk study? Yes. That was to look at uh, filling that gap along Route 2A. Oh, uh, that's path. Yeah, that's the, the, the almost more like a recreation path. Here it says path. Could be path or yeah. sidewalk. It's the same. The same. Same basic thing. Yeah. Okay. But, so uh, that's where the fires yeah. come from. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I'll follow up with Matt on the, on the planning side. Yeah. Uh, no yeah. rush. Any further discussion on the motion? <clears throat> if not, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> so we're running a little bit ahead of time, but let's so maybe we can go to the end of the uh, order in the town manager recruitment process and talk a little bit about that for uh, 15 minutes before we have a public hearing. And uh, so Joy and uh, Jeff and I met uh, yesterday along with uh, on a conference call with uh, Elaine Haney from Essex Junction, who I think is the current chair of the village uh, board, regarding the process that they used uh, to recruit a uh, new town manager for the, the town and village a kind of combined uh, <coughs> seat. <clears throat> Today we received something which we haven't, I haven't had a chance to look at from a member, uh, Mr. Brown, uh, with his uh, thoughts about what they did as far as the process goes and also some information on um, other uh, organizations that they re looked for as looked at as far as doing a project. So they did a, um, they, they hired a, a firm called Municipal Resources Incorporated <coughs> and um, it was about a four-month project that uh, they entered into and um, don't have an exact price that they, they paid for, but I think they said something around 16000 for that. <clears throat> they, uh, we talked a little, quite a bit about the process that they went through with public um, input to, to the process, the board's uh, input into the process, and how much uh, we might be interested in uh, having uh, as far as the town goes. So at the moment we have sort of a subcommittee of the board with the three of us that are uh, doing some of the groundwork. And um, what I am suggesting tonight is that we send out a request for proposals to two firms 
We have one from VLCT that we got last week. <clears throat> and uh, my thought is to send, have Rick send out, or make phone calls, at requesting uh, a project uh, for um, the Admissible Resources Incorporated, which was hired by Essex. And one that, Nick, that Rick knows is uh, GOVHR, and I think they're based in Illinois, and um, MRI is based in New Hampshire. We should add, though, too, that a big concern for the three of us when we were talking and that Essex was really running home with us was make sure we have somebody who is familiar with New England. With right. New England, absolutely. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Which is why that first company we were interested in. Yes. <coughs> So uh, at this point, I think that's where, if there's an agreement by the board to send that out, then we would have the, the information sent back to um, all of us <coughs> to look at. And uh, if you wish to have continue with the three of us to look at them and then come back and make a recommendation to you, we, we can certainly do that. Or we can do the whole board and have, <coughs> well, certainly we'll have your input. <coughs> I think a smaller group is better in this circumstance. So I think I'd be interested in hearing the recommendation. Yeah, it's not that I don't want to be involved. Um, I just think you've already got the ball kind of rolling. Um, See, I know if you did, I, I, like I don't have any problem stepping aside or whatever. I don't nope. want someone not, to not feel that they yep, can speak. I understand. Uh, no, nope, I'm fine. Um, I just think we're looking at options. I know time is of the essence as we spoke about last time, but I do think it's a good idea to look at some options. I think it's a good idea for us to um, give all of the information to you to look at, and we'll, we'll certainly be glad to do that, and then make a recommendation and uh, ask for your input at that point. Um, and hopefully, the sooner the better right. to get this ball going um, and down the road so that we can hopefully have um, a person on, on duty by July 1st. And that would be our goal, certainly. The two takeaways I, I, I came away with. One is we, I, I think we are gonna need a firm that is really gonna take the lead and kind of, we're gonna have to trust them and, and to, <clears throat> uh, to do a lot of the groundwork, the legwork, because we just aren't going to be able to. As, as I, I know myself, I just yeah, can't I spend that much that time. Way. So we really need, I mean, we, we'll need to pay for it, but we really need that assistance, if you will. The other one was um, what Essex did is they actually solicited proposals from various of these <laughs> recruitment firms. I'm not sure we need to do that. Um, that ended up taking them a good I think a month or a month and a half, if not longer. They had the two between the village and the town. And I also felt, I don't know if you felt this way, but after listening to her, I felt like they had done a lot of that labor. Like, well, I, that's a little bit of, I didn't want to quite say that publicly, but yeah, that's a but, little bit of it they is. Had, they figured out so yep. much. And that New England thing was the one that just, I really yep. walked away with going, okay, that was so important. I think that they actually went out and advertised with us two groups, the um, ICMA and the VLCT, uh, who actually do the advertising um, more or less themselves, I think, and then have the information go back to the, um, the company. You know, it, it seemed like they had two major efforts going on. One was selecting the firm yes. and then using the firm to do the whole recruitment process, and I'm hoping we can shorten up the selecting the firm piece of it, because <laughs> yes. uh, I still am worried. Um, six months, well, it's not six anymore, it's more like five and a half, maybe even shy of five and a half, is gonna go awfully quickly. Yes, it is. So. Um, I think we have an accord. <laughs> I, I have a, yes, if I may. Yes, please. <laughs> um, first, uh, I should point out, um, three members of the board constitutes a majority uh, yes. in the board. If you have a subcommittee, it should be posting notices of your meetings and having minutes. Yep. <laughs> okay. Secondly, what was the, you, you mentioned um, two firms, Municipal yes. Resource Inc., MRI, but and, what was the other and one? And GOVHR, which is one that you had to read. 
Actually, I don't. I I just picked that up from um, Essex. I, ah, okay. I oh, okay. <laughs> I actually was maybe the Essex manager had mentioned him, that group rather. Uh, I think he did, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not familiar with it, but yeah, okay. mm -hmm. it seems to me that those were the two. Well, those were the two that I think that uh, Essex uh, looked at as well. Yeah, those are the the top two that they eventually chose one from. And is there a uh, more specific scope of services? that you're looking for at this point. Uh, is there anything I, that, you, that you gathered from your phone call about the scope of services, I guess? Well, we would like uh, not to have uh, any burden on the town staff, yeah. if possible, and, um, or at least a limited amount uh, of, of it of a burden. <laughs> um, certainly, we need to know um, they perhaps a number of things when they if they have a sort of a staggered information system that they use uh, then what is the price for doing certain things like background checks um, advertising um, <clears throat> reviewing the applications which I think probably we would like to have them do and um, yeah. other thoughts and then present us with their top whatever picks. Yeah. <clears throat> and one of the pieces I liked about the way Essex did it is they had a public involvement co aspect of it that I I just really think is a good idea, you know, if we can. What does that look like? <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure, uh, but they had some... They had chosen some, number, some members of the community to work with the select board in determining who might be a good fit. Okay. And, and there was definitely <coughs> interaction between some of the candidates and somehow they assembled a citizens committee to help with the process. Um, well, that, that's an important point because to the extent you're going to be using a consultant to do a lot of groundwork or uh, and setting that up and running that, that will greatly affect the price. If it's something you're going to be doing internally, <coughs> Um, just in, uh, you know, deciding to involve some people, that's maybe a different matter. So I just caution you, if you're, yeah. the public involvement component is important, but it's wide open as far as what that means. Yeah. And so if you're trying to narrow the... What's that? I was thinking smaller as opposed to bigger, or we will not get a good decision. That's going to be the problem. I definitely think you should bring the public in, but I don't think you should be having a citizens group and a select board group. I think you're going to just, you won't get anywhere. Okay. And, and just to be clear, I, I'm not advocating. One way or the other. I'm just trying to uh, help you narrow or, or define the scope, <laughs> not narrow it, but define the scope, because I'm just pointing out that that component of this is, can be wide open and can, can be very labor intensive. Um, if that's what the board wants, that's fine, but then I need to communicate that to the consultants. Cost is one aspect of it. The other piece, again, is time. Is that, that was what yeah, I was yeah. thinking. My thought was if we needed to uh, have citizen input, input, we would ask people if they were interested in serving on uh, a small committee, um, have two or three uh, people from the community with different points of view, and um, along with uh, the gang of three here. <laughs> <laughs> the gang, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Town manager was hired by a gang. <laughs> <laughs> I thought for all CTs. It's usually the other way around. He's run out of town by a gang. <laughs> <laughs> I thought when VLCT presented last week that they mentioned that um, doing a, a, a search like this, we didn't have to abide by the open meeting law, but I'm not sure. As far as um, the actual interviews being held in executive session, uh, that is correct. Uh, okay, but but that's our, all. But our meetings. Yeah, if you're having a meeting, you still have to warn it. Okay. You still have to, okay. regardless of, as long as it's more than two right. board members. Right. Okay. Well, we. Well, this time we're just not connecting you on the conference phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I participated because of the static or whatever. Um, <laughs> That might be something we want to think about, whether we want two or three select board members on the committee, because it may streamline things just to have two, as opposed to having a meeting every time 
Well, it's not that it's not that burdensome to just post it. Uh, right. You know, that's something the staff could. You know, if you tell us the date and time, we can get it posted, and, okay. and the minutes can be very, very brief. So I wouldn't okay. use that as a mechanism to decide okay. how many should be on it. Okay. 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 <clears throat> Anything else tonight on this? Would that be with you, Rick, or with Eric, or? I'm sorry. When we when we have that communication about. I, I would probably have a go through Eric. Okay. Yeah. Piece of it. Anything else before we go to, to the public hearing? All right, uh, then. It's just about 8 o'clock, and under notice of public hearing on town charter amendments. Under the authority of 17 VSA, section 2645, the Wilson Select Board will hold a public hearing to receive public comment on proposed amendments to the Wilson Town Charter. Hearing will, held, will be held on Tuesday, January 21, 2020, at 8 p.m. at the Town Hall meeting room located at 7900 Wilson Road. This is the second of two public hearings required under state law before the amendments can be considered by Australian ballot at town meeting. So our proposals uh, are three in number as far as the uh, charter amendments go. Um, Eric, I think you have an uh, a memo to us tonight, which you perhaps should explain, and we'll go to public hearing. Yep. Um, let's find it. Oh, it's right in front of me. <laughs> um, pertaining to the letter from Bob Fletcher on Friday, Terry. Yes. Yep. The so the town received an opinion from council on Friday. Um, <clears throat> reviewed the language that we proposed in the town charter, and also the MOU draft that we have with the with the library trustees, which is later on on your agenda this evening. Um, one, one point to raise that, that Mr. Fletcher said in his letter, um, if the town should proceed with the MOU, it would not be legally enforceable unless the charter changes currently under consideration pertaining to the library are approved. Um, these changes effectively transfer management authority over the library director from the trustees to the town manager. Um, and this proposal, um, just as some, some background, was introduced <coughs> or formalized past uh, and present practice by the town. And in addition, Mr. Fletcher offered language changes to the charter proposal. Um, so staff is recommending tonight the select board choose one of two following um, pathways to proceed to revise the charter changes with the recommendations from the town attorney and proceed the warning these changes at town meeting. Um, I have some language that would accomplish this in a single article if, if the board makes that decision. And the other pathway would be to remove all cha charter changes pertaining to the library from the charter proposal. Um, two possible pathways that, that staff is recommending to be considered tonight. Um, and regardless what the what the boards decide, staff <laughs> recommends the uh, board still enter into the MOU with the library trustees, and that's there on the agenda. Good, thank you. So I'll open the public hearing, and Steve, I presume you'd like to talk uh, about the letter you sent to me. <clears throat> Uh, every select board member has received the letter that I sent to you, Terry, yes. so, so everyone has that. Um, the, the Board of Trustees uh, of the Dorothy Island Memorial Library has not changed its position um, that uh, we feel that the language managed the library, which is in the current town charter, um, should remain. So um, if there are no changes to those sections uh, or if language were to be changed, that it does include manage the library. Um, we have two uh, main reasons for that. Um, one, that uh, we are an independently elected board by the citizens of Williston um, to manage that library. Um, that follows our current town charter as well as um, current Vermont state law. Um, and uh, we, we feel that's very important. It's part of uh, Vermont tradition um, and part of operation of uh, towns and uh, free access to materials and knowledge. Um, as imagined going back um, a couple of hundred years. Um, also, um, by changing that language, um, it, it would uh, be in conflict with current uh, Vermont uh, state law at this point, um, which says manage the library uh, is part of the duties of uh, elected trustees. Um, this statute as well was challenged by the town of Hartford in uh, 2002. And the Vermont Supreme Court affirmed that the uh, 
above mentioned statute uh, supersedes the authority of the select board in management of the library. Um, and I do understand that changing um, the, the town charter uh, would affect state law. Um, however, we do feel that um, this is very important that the board continue to manage the library and come at a, uh, a way that we can work um, with uh, the town uh, as we have for, for many years um, to manage uh, the staff and the resources of that library. Um, I did want to read one piece that was not in my letter, um, and it's actually a portion of what the Vermont Supreme Court wrote um, in their um, ruling in 2002. And they write, the overlapping duties of town managers and other municipal entities require a spirit of cooperation for the efficient daily administration of the affairs of a town. In this way, library trustees and town managers across the state of Vermont can agree to a wide variety of power sharing schemes that best suit the needs of each particular town. They go on to say, and this is in regards to Hartford, but as in this case, when that spirit of cooperation is lost, the town cannot, in the name of administrative efficiency, infringe upon the board's full power to manage the library. The board is directly accountable to the voters of the town of Hartford. If the townspeople are unhappy with the performance of the library trustees, either because of a lack of administrative efficiency or for any other reason, they may vote the trustees out of office or they may decide to undertake a system in which the trustees are appointed by town officials rather than elected. I missed the meeting um, in December, the second reading of this. I apologize for not being here to comment on it. Um, I was in Ohio um, teaching a two-day course on um, Vermont history and culture and politics <laughs> to a group of 45 um, <clears throat> social studies teachers in southern Ohio. And uh, it really it jumps out at me. Um, we spent half a day uh, doing a mock town meeting um, with these educators, and um, th this was completely foreign to them and the idea of how transparent our government is um, in Vermont and you know, asking questions like, just, that is just not efficient, that doesn't work, uh, you know, how do you guys even function? Um, and, and my response to that group uh, was that you know, Vermont, the, the way we govern, um, it, it, it may not be necessarily efficient, um, it may not be the, the, the quickest way to the end, um, but in my mind and, and presenting to them and talking about our state that it is the best way to do that. Um, so um, our, our feeling as a board um, is that uh, we continue through our town charter and state law to manage the library. Thank you. Is there any questions for Steve? I do have one uh, for you. Are you. Is the library board still interested in pursuing the MOU? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, we think that is a, a, a wonderful way to address the, the um, you know, the questions and, and answering some questions and uh, coming to effective management of the library. Right. Any questions for Steve? I'm not sure how to exactly <clears throat> ask this question, so I might stumble a little bit. Hopefully it will, it will come out. It, it seems to me that there, um, the library board's position is manage the library is the appropriate language, and, and town staff has recommended um, different language. And I guess my question is, is, is there a possibility that the two sides, and maybe it's through the MOU process, I don't know, and I guess this is maybe even a larger question than just for you, Steve, is, is there, is there a way in which the two can agree on the language that should go into the town charter? Uh, we, we, we strongly believe that the language manage the library um, should remain in the town charter, and it should mirror state law. Uh, within that. That's, that's what we're elected to do. Um, creating an MOU or other agreement of that type that defines um, how that takes place, um, we're completely open to. And, and in, in practice, that's how that has proceeded in the past. So, if, if, and I'm sorry, I'm not, again, I don't know how to ask this question directly, so if I end up being blunt or kind of off the mark, please, please uh, give me some latitude here. Doesn't that then prevent, if the insistence on the language manage the library be in the town charter, kind of diminish the ability to have an MOU down the, down the road because 
the language that's in the charter will be the language that governs. Um, that, that's true, and I, we, we come to an agreement on how, um, you know, the, the functional piece of managing, uh, of managing that is. Um, you know, we, we are elected to, to manage the library. Um, I don't know. Ch Charity probably has better language than I, yeah. <laughs> I do. <laughs> okay. Um, one question for you. There's one part, part of the um, changes that are recommended here that puts new language in. It says the library director shall be appointed by the manager with the advice and consent of, and we'll add the majority of the board of trustees. Is the Are the trustees in favor of that part of uh, the charter change? We were fine with that um, because we read it as the board of trustees have the, the, the final say. And actually, that's been modified, that language. It's uh, appointment and removal. But, yes. uh, right. Which we agree with. <laughs> Are there further questions for Steve? <clears throat> Others who wish to speak? Charity? <laughs> Charity Clark, I sit on the Board of Trustees for the Dorothea <coughs> Library. I wanted to address your point, because I, I think I understand what you're saying, is it feels like there's this chasm and how is the MOU going to work. And what Steve said is right, that as a board, we are elected to manage the library, and the MOU would be an expression of how we want that to take place. So right now we have a great town manager, <coughs> and this is what we think the town manager should be doing. Um, every month we meet, we you know, learn from the library director and a staff person kind of what's going on. We get updates, oh, I met with Rick, here's what we talked about, here's the budget, so we're, you know, we're involved. Um, but the MOU would just help us articulate how things are going to work day to day. And I, does that answer your question? It does. I, I, and and I'm, again, my questions aren't meant to uh, relay my position, if you will. It's just try to make sure I understand. And it just seems to me that if the language in the charter is manage the library, and even though there might be an MOU that's agreed upon, because the language in the charter that says manage the library, at some point the board could just say, we're not going to honor the MOU anymore because we stand behind the manage the library language that's in the charter. That's exactly right. So, and the point with the, the, the legal determination that the MOU isn't legally enforceable. I think that means the law is that the library manages, the library board manages the library. So just because we are saying, oh, in the MOU, here's what we should do, here's what we, should. let me give an example from the case that um, uh, Steve mentioned, the Hartford case from 2002. The issue there, the, the power struggle between the library board and <coughs> the town manager was over the salary of the library director. So let's use that as an example. Say the town manager decided, you know, we can't afford this library director. We're going to half her salary. The library board could say, nope, no, no, no. You know, we don't want that. We're, we're managing the library. That's not what we want. Of course, in Hartford, it was the opposite. <laughs> it was the, the, uh, the, select, the board that wanted to cut the salary. But just to use that as an example. So even though the MOU has these specifics, it's just a memorandum of understanding. It's not like a, you know, a legally binding document. OK. <clears throat> so I, I, just again, so I'm clear, the, the language that is being proposed by for lack of better, you know, the town versus language being proposed by the the, the um, library board, you, we can't come to a common ground. Well, I think it, that would be hard. Are you saying you think we should co-manage? I don't know what the answer is. I'm just asking the question of, are we are we at a point where we just can't come to an agreement? Or <laughs> is there still room such that the charter language could, um, we both could agree on the language in the charter? I think that's part of the beauty of the MOU is, yeah, the buck stops with the board, but here's what we're envisioning this is going to look like. And I mean, I should add that because it's in state statute, my, my hunch is that the norm is for the library board in a town to manage the library. And every town who doesn't want that has to go through a pretty dramatic process to undo that. So I, I, my understanding is this is sort of the norm of how things are done. 
in Vermont Luckily, anyway. Williston isn't normal. <laughs> We're extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else that wishes to speak tonight? <clears throat> Jim. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, Jim McCullough. I reside in the Northeast Kingdom of Williston. And uh, I want to thank you, Eric and, and <clears throat> Rick, and the tireless members of this board who come here regularly in the evening when they have other family <clears throat> business obligations. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm coming to speak uh, in behalf of the Dorothy Alling Memorial Library, uh, and I'll just start out by saying <clears throat> this is a quote that we're all familiar with. If it's not broke, don't fix it. And I'm, I'm struggling, and, and people that I've inquired of have struggled to find out what's broken. So in the late 40s, I went to the Williston Library in the, the uh, Warren store, which is now torn down, across the route to from the Federated Church with my mom and old uh, Floyd, Mr. Putnam, to me, thank you very much, was working the library there. And a f some years after that, I went to tea with my mother in a ridiculous little suit with a vest and cap and shorts to visit Dorothy Alling um, at her home. And when I was in the seventh grade, we had a brand new library built where it sits today, the Dorothy Alling Memorial Library. And I recall my seventh grade teacher saying, this is a beautiful building, too bad there's no books. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, geez, there's some books here, but truly there weren't enough. Since then, our library board and our library directors have combined to not only fill that library with uh, overabundance of books, more books than they can store, they built a, an addition on the library, they added computers, they added all kinds of programming. They're, they're not just a library, they're a town center. We don't have a town center, by the way. That's another topic I'd approach the board with another day. But it's as close as we can come, intergenerational town center. <clears throat> if it's not broke, don't fix it. I urge the board um, to just say, you know, we don't need this charter change, period. Work on an MOU, um, which I understand is well in progress, but I don't know if everyone can agree on it by vote time tonight about whether it ought to be printed in the, in the uh, town report or not. But I just urge the board to say, you know, um, there isn't a big rush. There's always next year if we do discover that it's broken. And, you know, in the interim, we can, we, can, we can find out what that problem is and then maybe find a real solution. Um, thank you a lot for your attention. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions for Jim? If not, are there other folks who wish to speak tonight? Yes. My name is Sue Hersey. I'm a trustee at the uh, Dorothy Allen um, Library. Um, one of the reasons that we moved to Williston is the library. Um, when we moved here, they just had opened the children's wing. And it was so impressive um, when we were visiting that that we decided that we would actually look to, to build a house here in Williston. Um, and so being familiar with things. I've been here for 22 years now, and I've gone to numerous uh, conferences for um, libraries in 
in Vermont. And every time that I'm there, I'm always impressed about how, how amazing our library actually is. And I agree with Jim McCullough. It really is about as close as we can come to to have a community center. <clears throat> um, the, it isn't just the books that are there. Um, there's a genuine love for this library. And I think people in this town take it very seriously when they elect people to sit on the board. Um, when, for instance, when our um, bookmobile died um, and we debated would we just let the whole program die or would we look into <coughs> what else we could do if we had one that was specifically made for the library. Um, people contributed amazingly they contributed enough money for us to be able to get this beautiful bookmobile. And one of the most impressive things, Jim was talking being a child going to the library, um, that I remember being there one day and a little boy came in and he had his piggy bank. And he opened it up and poured all the money that was in there because he wanted to contribute it to the, to the bookmobile. So uh, sitting on the board as a trustee, I've taken really seriously, and I think everybody that's on there feels this very same way. Um, I think there's a difference between being elected or being appointed, because I sit in other um, positions in this town, um, and the ones that are appointed, while we really, really um, put our heart into it, um, we are appointed, we can be taken off that at any point. Um, being elected, by the people in this town, and we all know how hard it is for people to go out and vote. I think that would be sending the wrong message to the people in the town if we kind of ceded the, um, the authority to run the library um, uh, to someone else. Um, while we've been working on it together, it's been a pleasure to work with Rick. Um, again, he has a wonderful reputation and We've really never had any noticeable problems um, that I've heard of anyway. Um, but Rick's leaving. And if you pay attention to politics, um, all you need is to have one person come in and decide they're going to change everything. I don't think this is the time to make changes. We're going to have to adjust to a whole new town manager, and Rick's shoes are going to be very hard to fill. Um, but I think the way the charter is and that the um, authority for the general running of the library really should remain with the trustees. And again, I'm very proud of the library that we've had here. Um, as I said, as a child, I spent so much time in the library um, and even taught my sister how to read and we got our picture on the front page of the paper because we read so many books in the summer. And that's just a tiny little program compared to what this <clears throat> library does now. I'm amazed at we're a, what we're able to do. So I don't really see any reason to make a huge change, and especially not now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, anyone else who wishes to speak uh, tonight before we close the public hearing? Mm -hmm. See no hands raised. The motion to close the public hearing would be in order. I'd move to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor of closing the public hearing say aye. 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 Any opposed? So I have a suggestion under uh, the charter change proposal. Uh, and my suggestion, I can't make a motion, but uh, my suggestion is, is to leave the language, uh, the original language under 14J5, where the uh, library trustees have the full power to manage the library. Um, and all, only the words that <coughs> existed before uh, in there. And also to um, include the, the language under 16J, which now talks about the library director shall be appointed or removed by the manager with the advice and consent of the majority of, uh, I think it's a majority of yes, the library board of trustees. That's my suggestion to you to discuss.
I agree with both of them. <laughs> That's in the charter change. It's this, the proposed charter change itself that you're amending, that you uh, suggest that we amend. I'm suggesting that we ch change the wording in the proposal that we had before us to do um, the two things. I think I'm on board with that. Does this mean we have to have another public hearing? No. Okay. Not that that would affect my decision, just. When you say two things, I just want to clarify. You're just, yes. It's really only one change to the existing charter. It's one about. change. Yes. It's going okay. back to the original wording right. on uh, 14J5, right. which doesn't, will not show up as a change. That's right. Okay. Yes. That's fair. Thank you. I think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. I'm on board. Um, Somebody would, if somebody would make a motion to that effect. So moved. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Is there a discussion on the motion? Just a, 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 this a legal question. I think I know the answer, but um, our charter change has to be approved by the legislature. It has to be first approved by the voters, voters and, and then, then approved by the legislature. <clears throat> and then um, if it is approved by the legislature, it trumps the state statute found at 22 VSA from 143A anyway, right? Yes. Okay. Right. For discussion on the motion. <clears throat> all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? So thank you all for coming tonight. Mm. Thank you. I think we've solved our problem. Yep. Please don't clap. Do not clap. No, no clapping or joy in this room. Okay. No <laughs> clapping or joy in this room. <laughs> <laughs> laughter, but it has to be derisive. We're just doing our jobs. Yeah. Yeah, but that was that was everybody was talking about the way that we yes. did it this time. Yeah, it doesn't happen. Doesn't, doesn't, but doesn't doesn't happen very often, Jeff. Exactly. Um, did, did you have to say about the chart or the memorandum of understanding, Rick? Uh, um, do you want to address that? Sure. Um, I. I uh, there's no ex um, immediate time pressure on this draft MOU, but. I wanted to get the, because of all this discussion, I wanted to get you the latest draft and keep this process moving. Um, when I um, first had a conversation with uh, our attorney on this, and he described that, um, you know, do you understand that this won't be enforceable? And I, do you still want me to review it and provide comment? And I said, absolutely, because I think there is value in it, uh, regardless of whether it's enforceable or not. Just as a select board policy, uh, you have lots of them, they're not enforceable, but yet yeah. the board follows them. Um, this is a little bit different because there's multiple parties involved and there's a lot that can go wrong um, and the whole thing could easily fall apart. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I do think it, it does serve uh, a good ground, lays a good groundwork for a relationship that hopefully will continue to be very positive in the future. Um, and. I, I chafed a little bit when um, Jim was saying, if it isn't broke, don't fix it, because that's not quite the situation here, um, but the board's already decided, and that, that's fine. Um, I, I, what we're trying to do is prevent a problem happening in the future, because what we have now is not consistent with what the state law and our town charter says. But that's okay. <laughs> Could, I, that went over my head a little bit. Could you say that again or say it differently? Well, the, the, as I said this <clears throat> earlier, and, and I'm not, I'm, again, I'm not trying to I change anything. I just, yeah, no, it, we're, we're, yeah. Um, my point that I made earlier was that the um, library director manages the library just mm -hmm. as the town manager manages the town, and both persons, whoever serves in those positions, are supervised and given policy direction by the respective elected boards. Um, and um, so the, all the responsibility for lots of different things um, has been worked out between um, the library trustees and, and staff, and it's worked quite well. And, and they're quite right. If there's a change, neither the manager or in, potentially on any board member, that can fall apart pretty easily. Yeah. <clears throat> so, but my point is that um, it, it's good to have that discussion, even if... You know, it, it's being resolved, that's fine. Um, but I think that having that discussion was healthy and hopefully it will set the groundwork for 
um, a stable relationship in the future, regardless of who's in those various positions. Okay. Yeah. So, anyway, how do we get off from that? <laughs> oh, it so, was, I was responding to a question. Sure. So are we getting close to having an agreement? Um, yeah, so uh, we've, um, there, oh, there, um, there aren't a, a lot of substantive changes from the earlier draft. We, uh, the attorney added a bunch of whereases, which I, I actually kind of, I knew, I was thinking of Jeff when I raised the issue, but I do think it helps um, set the, the, the table, so to speak, for the issues. Um, there is one issue in there that we have to think about, um, and I, I think the answer is, um, uh, well, the issue is, um, what happens if there's a grievance or an issue involving someone at the library? It comes to the manager's office. It's whoever um, brings that grievance is not happy with the way the manager decides it. Who hears the appeal on that grievance? For normal town, or not normal, for <laughs> most town employees, it, it comes to the select board. Uh, if it's a library employee, should it come to the select board or should it go to the library trustees? Now, I brought this issue to the attention of the library trustees and after some discussion, they felt it should come to the trustees. And in fact, I, I kind of felt it should too, given the, the relationship there. But, um, but our, our attorneys are raising the question that it's inconsistent with the town policies. And, so I, I don't know, um, I haven't had a chance to discuss this with the trustees, but that's an issue I think we need to have a little bit further discussion on before we finalize that one. Wouldn't it automatically go to the trustees because they manage the library? Well, well, right, so I, I guess that's true. But well, of course, a lot of other things, and, and this is the problem, a lot of other things should be done by the library, but they're not, um, and they haven't been. Yeah. But this um, uh, MOU will help to define and, and give some comfort to the manager. I mean, the, the issue that was raised about setting the salary is extremely important to me as a manager because if I'm responsible for managing the and, and having some responsibility over the library director, um, that person's got to be within the same pay structure that everyone else is. And to the extent that either the library trustees try to change it by either reducing it below or raising it above, then I'm going to have a, uh, the manager's going to have a problem with that because it's not consistent with the pay structure we have. And it's, it's a well thought out pay structure and with uh, a whole series of criteria that are used to evaluate a position every time we create a new position. And um, so someone from the outside changing that can really then uh, it, it, it's, it's a major issue. That's why it was uh, brought out in Hartford and, and went to the state Supreme Court. <laughs> so, um, and, and this MOU will help somewhat, but it will eliminate that problem. But anyway, I'm not here to argue that point. I'm just raising that as an issue in the MOU. Um, so I, I think um, I'd like to have a discussion with the uh, trustees on that. Sure. <clears throat> but, are there any other issues that the board uh, has a concern with in this latest draft? Of the, of the town charter? No, 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 the MOU. 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 I mean, you don't, you don't, we, the board doesn't, I'm not asking the board to approve it tonight. I'm I just trying to get it moving inches closer to a resolution on this between the two boards. I, I can't honestly answer that right yet. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, that's fine. I'm just, I'm more concerned about, uh, the word isn't concerned, I'm sorry. I just wonder is the MOU is going to be good to have the policy in place. I just worry about the concept of down the road, could it be deemed to almost to be, the word isn't meaningless, but just disregarded if the, if the library board were ever to take a very strong stance and just say, yeah, it's just a policy, you can't enforce it. And we have that language in the charter that says manage the, the library. Well, yeah. But we. The answer is yes. Correct. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, mean, I, I understand the library's view. Would it ever get? Would it ever get to the? I mean, not that I'm at all envisioning this, but would it ever get to the point where the town and the library have their own separate budgets? I, probably not, but it could happen. Unless the library gets power to impose a property tax. 
So. Oh my goodness, yeah. yeah so no. Where would the revenue come from? Right? <laughs> right. You can create as many budgets as you want. <laughs> <laughs> Those book fines are going to go up. <laughs> Similar conversation with my teenagers at home. <laughs> uh, just. Anything else on MOU tonight? If not, we'll revisit this at some point in time. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. So we're on to our next problem, and that is sidewalk winter maintenance requests. And our next opportunity to yeah, do yeah. <laughs> And Eric, I think you have a uh, memo for us. Yep. So at the board's request after our <clears throat> meeting last week, I, I put a memo in your packet that breaks down um, some cost numbers um, and some different scenarios here to call upon the request. Uh, we got to this point, we have requests following the board's policy for um, sidewalk maintenance to include an FY21 start next winter for the Hamlet neighborhood and um, Indian Ridge neighborhoods. So I'll, I'll hit the highlights of my memo. I'm happy to take questions of how I arrived at these numbers, but um, three scenarios to look at. The first one, the current cost to plow, uh, a portion of sidewalks, which is our current practice, um, just about 15 and a half miles works out to be um, $16,675 per year is our um, estimated cost amount using a number of variables. The cost per linear foot breakdown there um, works out to about 20 cents. So the cost to plow all sidewalks, so adding an additional 14.1 miles, and running a second sidewalk plow uh, would cost about an additional 17000 so over $17,000 each year on, on the operational side. Um, since the personnel costs are already budgeted, the added costs associated with the enhanced level of service would be capital costs and operation of, of the second sidewalk plow. We have um, within the budget a part-time public works um, employee who most likely be running this plow. Um, for numbers wise, I blended, I blended some rates and because Position is open right now. Full-time person could end up running that at some point, but um, that cost variance isn't very high. So, if, if the board were to move forward with this option and decide next winter you want to run a second sidewalk plow, um, you essentially would need to add about forty-three thousand dollars to the FY twenty-one budget. Um, that that covers mainly the capital cost for a lease purchase agreement for the second plow in, in that short term and the operating expenses there. So this bottom line number to run both plows, plow all the sidewalks, would be um, just under $63,000 per year. <coughs> and that works out to about 40 cents per linear foot, or just over $2,000 per mile of sidewalk. And then the, the final option we've discussed is the fee-for-service model. And, and Bruce can jump in here as well. The, the town's about a critical mass of sidewalk mileage when, it, when a second plow is going to be uh, necessary, um, probably sooner rather than later. And public works to manage a single plow as long as needed, but as the mileage increases, the amount of time it takes a single plow to complete a route increases as well. So part of the ongoing discussion will be the, the level of service um, piece here. But I, I've run numbers looking at our two requests from Indian Ridge and the Hamlet based on uh, cost per linear foot with the amount of feet in each of these neighborhoods. And you'll see a schedule at the bottom of the memo running it from charging uh, 40 cents per linear foot down to five cents per linear foot. Um, I'll highlight our, our current cost of 20 cents. Um, if the board were to go with that amount or do something higher than that, that um, additional cost from today's operational costs added onto it, those funds could potentially put towards capital savings for a second. Overall, this would add, adding these two neighborhoods would add just about a one and a third miles of plowing. Those are the numbers at a, kind of a high level. I'll have to take any questions from the board on this. Questions? <coughs> Comments? But Indian Ridge, we don't have the mechanical ability to do that now anyway. This is a smaller sidewalk. Is that correct? <coughs> It's not going to hurt the plow. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt the green space in the side and the yard. <clears throat> Just to clarify, if I may, um, with sure. the Jill Clong again with the new ridge, 
Um, the survey is Brandon Wood five feet. Uh, I don't know that I have it right in front of me. Which ones are which? Only because the only reason I asked is because whatever the width of the plow that they're using is the same as ours, and it seems fine. I mean, again, we haven't had a spring to, to see what kind of damage there is, but with the amount of snowfall that there is, it doesn't, doesn't seem to be having any impact um, from a plowing perspective to, um, to use that same equipment. They're not using, they're not using the same kind of equipment they were using, now that's, that's the issue. They're using, I don't know what they're using, tractors or we don't we don't plow Brennan Woods, do we? No, we do not. Okay, yeah, that's that's not a town plow that's doing Brennan Woods. <laughs> yeah, I just was wondering if it was four feet. I just uh, I was wondering if it was four feet there. I, I don't I don't. I think they're using some kind of bobcat, but I don't know the width of the bobcat either. Our plow our plows our plow is five feet wide, so if the sidewalk's four feet wide, mm -hmm. we're going to be off the sidewalk six inches on either side. And that's not a problem it, when the, everything's frozen up, but right. the first snowfall in the fall in the and the last one in the spring, mm -hmm. yeah, that's when you get the most damage. Can it be angled? Does it have sure, we can, we can angle the plows. Uh, Five feet wide. This is not a perfect science. They're gonna. I mean, you know, uh -huh. the sidewalks. We go out and we put all those grain stakes you see all over the place, so the guys know where to go with the sidewalk plows. And somebody comes along and takes them and throws them all away on us. So when the guys go plowing, they don't know exactly where those sidewalks are. So it's just not. It's not the same as a curved road or a road that's this nice big defined. Yeah. So what, what he's saying is that even if we had a five-foot plow and a five-foot sidewalk, we're still going to do some uh, do lawn damage. <laughs> Just part of the game. And I don't know if it makes sense or if I'm just kind of throwing this out there for, for no reason, but is it possible to agree that, hey, we understand, you know, we, we the community of Indian Ridge and the town of Williston, we understand that you know, because the, the sidewalks are this size, and that there could be some reseeding that's done in the spring, and that's that's the cost of doing business. Or I mean, is that that's what we're talking about in terms of damage, right? Like a little bit of grass damage. It's already our policy. Just to let the select board know, states right in there. We don't go and do. We won't repair plow damage, but we do. So if you, want to, if you want to go by the policy and tell me that we don't have to go repair plow damage anymore, we're, we're more than accepting it. We will do that, but that's not what's been going on. But for, I'm just wondering if perhaps in this situation, because our sidewalks are known to be you know, well below the, the size of the um, town's plowing equipment, whether or not we as the representatives can obviously, if our community agreed that, yeah, we'll, we'll take care of, we'll be responsible for any reseeding in the spring that occurs. So that that issue is not um, one that the town would have to go and, and do cleanup in the spring, at least in our community. <clears throat> Other questions or comments? And it's important that we make a decision tonight yes, uh, whether it is. it's going to affect the budget or not. On the public works side, we're perfectly, we're perfectly fine with the plow night sidewalk and tell us the plow. We'll, we'll figure it out. But, uh, I don't know. is something I've always brought up that, you know, is more damage is all. We'll certainly figure it out. When we go to snowblowers, all bets are off anyway. Yeah. So, Wait, wait, say that again, I'm sorry. We go to the snowblowers, you know, we can't angle snowblowers or anything okay. else. They're yeah. five feet wide. They're gonna do a five foot swath yeah. regardless of what we try to do with them. 
Okay. Mr. Gentleman's right. Yeah, we can angle. We can angle a straight plow. We can't angle a B plow. B plow's already angled, and that's yeah. the plow we plow with. Ninety percent of the time, that plow's only fifty-two inches wide. When we go to the straight plows or the, or the snow blowers, we're in a whole different ball game. So, I'll start out with just a couple thoughts. One is I'm hesitant to increase the budget, but I also recognize that we are looking at a new plow sometime in the near future, probably no matter what, because we're growing. And um, our, um, our, what, our um, core area is getting more dense, and I just assume that we're gonna need to be doing you know, more plowing in that area. My concern, the, the part I'm uneasy with more than the cost is, is the concept of who's in, who's out. And the kind of almost the annual request coming in, I just don't know if that's the best way to decide who's in, who's out. I'm also concerned with the having to repair afterwards. If you've got a policy right now that's going that we're repairing, and even if people are opting out, I am worried about how that's going to play well, out. The policy is that we don't repair. Yeah. I know, but it's just the goodness if I just of heard you correctly, you're saying, as a matter of fact, you actually do. That kind-hearted public yeah, works yeah. department. Yeah. Before I got here, Joy, it's always happened. That, that's a concern for me moving forward. More, more than some of the other stuff, actually. Me too. You know, I think the repair should be similar to, you know, plowing the road is, you know, just when the plow goes by, whether I like it or not, snow is going to end up in my driveway and I'm going to have to shovel it. And if your neighborhood is getting plowed by the town and dirt gets pushed out of the way because of how the, then you're just going to be out there in the spring <laughs> pushing dirt around and reseeding. Um, I in terms of what's specifically before the board now, my my I don't have a firm decision, a hundred percent. But I, I am leaning towards saying that we should plow Indian Ridge because of the proximity to the school. Um, I think that makes sense. Um, the hamlet um, on the fence on, and I I'm not sure I would do that. Um, make it so that there is a winner and a loser, but that's, because um, I think the, the factors are different for the Hamlet than they are for Indian Ridge. Um, if I could, if I could, since you want to start doing more walks, it, the last time, we, it's taking us four hours right now to do sidewalks. That was with a four inch storm that we just had. That six inch storm, we took, it took 12 hours. <clears throat> they worked eight hours one day and four hours the next day because of the trucks going by and plowing sidewalks back in and us having to go back out. So we do not have a lot of wiggle room to add any more sidewalks to what we're doing now without having more equipment. Yep. <clears throat> So last week we had a suggestion, I think by Ted, to add um, something to the town meeting warning to discuss the issue, uh, which would be perhaps more than just one uh, neighborhood, but uh, plowing in general or plowing all the town sidewalks. I still would like that. It doesn't really relieve us of the responsibility we have tonight. Um, but it does, but I would like to hear from the entire town, such as we can in a town meeting, um, what, what people, what, <clears throat> I'm sorry, what people are thinking, because it's, you know, it's one of these issues where you're talking about an increase in $17,000 in operating, as I understood it, which is not the entire increase to the budget, because we'd have to increase our equipment uh, expenditures as well. Um, so, you know, in, in a budget that is now as big as Williston's is now, that's not huge, but it's, you know, one of the reasons that we have, I'm going to, I'm going to brag, our, the second lowest municipal tax rate in Chittenden County is because we are old curmudgeons and stingy. Um, <laughs> um, and, well, most of us are old, 
Mr. St. Hilaire is uh, not. I'm, hope, I'm hopeful that's a compliment. Every, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Every day you're a little bit. Yeah. Um, but but I, I do think that, it, you know, I would like to hear what the whole, you know, what, what a, a town forum would have to say about it and a town forum that isn't dedicated just to this issue because if it's dedicated just to this issue, you're going to get a skewed sample. Um, as with any issue before the board, you know, where the room is, is f full or at least occupied by people who are, you know, passionate about something, but most people don't even know the issue exists. But if, yeah. if they did, they'd have an opinion. Um, I also think I would have made possibly different decisions on earlier discussions we had about expenditures. That's a good point. Yep. If you were going to pull yeah. this in. And I, it, it, well, I think it's important, and I agree with Ted, and I agree with the fact that more so right now, Indian Ridge needs to be. I am really loath to mess with this budget any more than we have. I just, I, I would have a big problem with that right now. Okay. So we, like I think we need to have some kind of a motion to either do the plowing or reject the request. I would move to accept the request for sidewalk plowing for Indian Ridge. Is, that Is there a second to the motion? Hearing no second, then the motion dies. <clears throat> Is there any other motion to be made? No, I don't think it's. I would love to support yeah. you. I just can't. If we have no other motions, then I think the the request actually dies just for lack of action. Yeah. May, I, may I offer one other sure. possible suggestion? Yeah, sure. What if, what if Indian Ridge were to be willing to pay the 20 cents of, or 30 cents, whatever it is, um, cents per linear foot? <clears throat> It's not, it's not a matter of, it's not that, that's not the concern for public works right now. It's that we're, we don't have the ability to add more to what we have right now. <clears throat> we, we can, I mean, we'll do, we can do whatever. If you want our sidewalk plow to be operating eight hours for a regular snowstorm, we can do that. That's not the norm. We try to keep it the same as the, one, the, the plow routes because four hours to get around one time if you're going around twice, there's eight hours. If you're going around three times, there's 12 hours. So the longer we make that initial push, the longer it is to get all, all the way around. And the minute, you go, the minute that we get the big storms where we have to go to the uh, blowers, <coughs> we can be days. We can be days as it is now. And remember, we have one machine. If it goes down, nobody's getting done. <laughs> So there's lots of good reasons here to have a second machine, but the, the length of time it's taking to do them right now is the big thing. And I have been very consistent with saying we're getting to the point where we just don't have any more room to add more sidewalks. So it may be that the in fiscal year 22, if the board decides to include that in the capital budget, that might give them a little more leeway to add additional sidewalks if they so choose. That's what you're saying. Machine. Yes. Oh, sure. Yeah. Then, then we can, <clears throat> if we had another machine and we were just to keep doing the policy the way we're doing now, we'd have years of being able to. And if a machine breaks, it would take us longer to get things done, but we'd still be yeah. able to get them done. So it sounds okay. So that would be another another year's uh, budget than that we consider, would consider next year. It's been in the capital <clears throat> right along, and, and I think it's actually in 2022 for, for at least half of it or something at this point. Right. Yeah, I think it is. So can we focus a little bit on town meeting? How do we? How w will we foster that discussion? Well, just before you get into that discussion, uh, okay. Article 4, draft of the draft warning, it says to discuss whether the town should maintain all public sidewalks and pave recreation paths during the winter months. Parentheses, bold, or, or all caps, no vote will be taken, close parentheses. Yeah, okay. That was the addition of our legal counsel. Um, so that, that is the proposal. 
Um, and I think your question, though, gets more towards what would that process, that discussion, look like? Is that what will it look like? But what, I, what I'd love, love to get out of that discussion is some clear direction. I realize mm -hmm. not all town residents attend town meeting. It's usually a fairly small representative of, but representation of. But I'd like to get some clear direction about how residents feel. I mean, it could be everything from, you know, town shouldn't be doing any sidewalks to town should be doing all sidewalks. And it would be great if I had something mm -hmm. I felt that I could advocate for maybe a policy change. Um, so, <laughs> Because I, I want more specif specif specificity. Sorry. Thank you. And what's in, what's out, as opposed to this annual process we go through of people applying and they may or may not get selected. So I think we'll need to discuss that when we get to the approval okay. of the warning and sure. close out the conversation tonight on the uh, yeah. maintenance requests. Unless I hear some other motion, we'll call it quits on that one for tonight. No, thank you. Thank you for coming again. <clears throat> and Jill, just for the record out there, I mean, I, I definitely firmly believe that we have to take some action. I just don't know until it's budgeted for that piece of equipment. I think that's kind of where we're at. But in yeah. all fairness, the addition is $600 to a $10 million budget. That's what we're asking for. It's not like we're asking a huge dollar amount. <clears throat> Moving on to capital budget and program, and I think there's no changes in the recommendation from last week regarding that. Right, I mean, we've right. Yeah. Uh, we, we, uh, I guess um, the uh, list of possible adjustments and changes. I've taken what we had talked about at the last meeting, <clears throat> put those um, changes that the board. Um, had tentatively agreed to. I don't think there's any vote on any of that um, in the approved column for the select board, which does include the $50,000 for, um, and I'm talking operating budget, but um, there's capital items in there as well. Um, and so uh, provided that those changes to capital are acceptable, <laughs> then the capital budget should be. If they're acceptable, then a motion is in order to adopt the uh, capital budget and program. Okay, I have uh, one question. Yes. Last week, and I noticed that uh, as I was reviewing for tonight's meeting, the deputy chief, the 10000 Yes. That's not in the budget. That's, we're not, we're talking capital right now. Okay. Yeah. Yes, capital. So if we're... If acceptable to to us for the capital budget, we need a motion. I'd move to adopt the capital budget and program for fiscal year 2021 through 2026 as presented. Second. For discussion on the motion. Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Moving on to the general fund budget operating. I, I see the point that um, Shirley was just making. Um, I had uh, inadvertently left that out out of select board adopted um, the 10,000. This is item 11 on possible changes. So including that would change the bottom line by 10,000. Yes. And really doesn't do much as far as uh, increasing the, uh, the tax rate. No, it's insignificant. But, but I had intended to include that as well. So the the net of the um, select board adopted will be ten thousand six seventy. Yes. Sorry, Rick. I meant to mention your yeah. tax. You were gone, and I noticed that I was tying the numbers from the January version to the warning. Yep. So the draft warning does include that ten thousand, though. I think, right? That? No, it probably doesn't. The warning does not. Yeah. Okay. So modify that. Questions, uh, comments on the operating budget or a motion would be in order. <clears throat> Move to adopt the general fund budget for fiscal year 2021 in the amount of $11,661,210. Second. 
Does that include the 10,000? Yes. So it would be 671,000 with the added. Six, so, yeah, yes, that <laughs> number. Thank you. Second. <laughs> motion made and seconded. Is there discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> Moving on to the Money Book Brook Culvert Replacement, uh, an article on the, um, the warning. Questions? <clears throat> this is just to approve going through a, uh, asking for a bond issue. Well, this is to establish a permanent yes. fix mm. <laughs> yeah, to yes. a uh, temporary bridge that was just temporarily fixed. <laughs> um, and this is uh, <laughs> the, um, it's been agreed that Williston is paying half the cost of that and South Burlington will be paying the other half. So the total project cost is 1.8 million at this point. And uh, the design um, has already been, or the preliminary, or the, what's the word? Oh, well, the design has been kind of reviewed by the board and, and the preferred alternative selected, so the design is going to be reflecting that preferred alternative. There's one uh, typo on the, the warning uh, at the bottom, and it says Jeff Harris, vice chair, and it should be Joy Lamoge, vice chair. <clears throat> Yeah, we'll fix that. Yep. Pick up. The only thing on the warning under, art, it says Article 7, and I wonder, should it reference that us, um, South Burlington will be responsible for the second half? I know it says it in the resolution, <clears throat> but I'm wondering if the warning should reflect that. It does say Willison will be paying half the cost, but I wonder if it should identify who is paying <laughs> the other half. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, let me just pick, pull up the document. Which document is it now? It's the warning itself, not the, the one. Town it's only, yeah. Yeah. The town not the one we're going to sign tonight. Notice. The hearing it's notice yeah. is the one you're looking. Oh well, sure. If it's just a hearing notice, that that's not a problem. Um, <clears throat> I think Jeff is talking about the actual article on the. On the yes, the actual article that oh. will go into the um, town. Town warning. No, we'll we'll be looking at that in a moment. <clears throat> I, I'll have to check with legal counsel on that one because we ran this by legal counsel already. Okay. Oh, I think it's no, supposed it has, to say has to have a question mark because it's a, it's, a, it's the question oh, you voted on. It's a question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> So I'm looking for a motion oh, to um, resolve Jeff's question. I, I I can't say we should add it without. I don't know what. You're going to muddy the already muddied waters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah maybe. Yeah. But I will say that there. I I was reading um, minutes from a town meeting Hurl held very early in the history of this town, where the town agreed to pay half the cost of a bridge. <laughs> that was it. Didn't identify who the oh, other. No, it didn't. And the um, the bridge, I think, was um, uh, Van Sicklin. Uh, mm. uh, that bridge. <laughs> and that's the early history of the town. I, and I laughed at it because I said, "Oh, that's interesting." Half the, uh, what happened to the other half? But I knew. I, of course, I know the answer. But in that case, they didn't say who was yeah. paying the other half. I, I don't think it's a big deal, and I don't want to hold things up. Um, Make everybody come in you know, sometime later this week to sign it. Um, <laughs> well, you will anyway. Uh, We're not going to have this ready tonight. Oh, that's right. You can't because, uh, yes. Um, oh, we can't for some reason. But So uh, <clears throat> usually we, uh, you produce an, a document that explains things on. Right, yeah. the informational yes, document uh, that goes yes, out. Yeah, it will be there. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. It will be in the hearing notice too. Yeah. But isn't it? But in any event, the Muddy Brook motion. Yes. Chair, uh, I'd move to adopt the necessity resolution and declaration of official intent for pursuing authorization from voters for $900,000 in bonded indebtedness for the town's share to construct a Muddy Brook culvert crossing replacement at Marshall Avenue at town meeting 2020. Second. <clears throat> for discussion on the motion. Very none. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed. Moving on to the town meeting warning 2020. <clears throat> okay, 
So um, well, this, we, we won't have this ready, as I said, just a moment ago to, um, for the board to sign because we've, we've got to make changes to, yes. uh, well, Article 6, we just made a change. Um, all, Article 9, which is the uh, section relating to library, we'll have to make a change. And I think those are the only two changes we're looking at at this point. Um, and then we had a brief discussion a few moments, moments ago about the um, <coughs> Article 4, which is the discussion on sidewalk maintenance. The board wants to discuss this. Um, I have an idea on the sidewalk maintenance thing. It's, it, I think the article as it's written is completely fine, but the conduct of the meeting, my thought is that if we could have a um, memo and presentation that uh, along the lines of what Eric presented um, that would talk about uh, the global global issue of how much uh, uh, how much sidewalk the town has how much is being plowed now how much that costs now um, and then the additional cost for doing all of the sidewalks both capital and operational um, and possibly something uh, maybe something on the effect of what that would do to, uh, if, if that were a part of the current budget, what would that would do to the anticipated property tax rate. Um, I think that would, if that presentation were made, that would give people a basis of an understanding. Um, I'm, still, I'm still thinking it's gonna be an interesting conversation because some people are gonna be buried in the numbers and other people are <coughs> gonna be uh, buried in the, the principle of the thing. Yeah. Um, but that's uh, that's part of part of the town meeting. So after that presentation, then it would be just a matter of opening up the floor for comments. Yeah. Just have Mr. Lamb with a, a whip in a chair. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, you you spoke earlier about the the spectrum of service, and the other end of the spectrum is the town not plowing any sidewalks. Right. And, you know, some towns have a local mm -hmm. ordinance or a policy right. for that issue of it. Would the board want to at least broach that as a bullet point within the presentation? Sure. I mean, it's. I think we should present the range, and sure. we're looking for direction. And, and right now, we fall somewhere in between with this method of um, reviewing kind of applications every year. And it, it, do we want to continue that way, or? Yeah, I think. I'm guessing the board may want to stay away from that whole policy at, at this point because we're just talking about the concepts. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, but yeah. But that zero that zero option where we don't plow any sidewalks reminds me of when I was one of the last Richmond town meetings I went to. Uh, somebody made a motion from the floor to uh, delete line items in the budget, this and that, and it was it was the police department. And um, it was a spirited debate, actually. <laughs> right then and there, are we going to kill off right. the police department? Mm -hmm. we, we didn't. Yeah. <laughs> so are we ready to have a motion to approve the uh, warning as amended? I'm not sure what the recommended motion is, but we have amended it. Uh, I would move to adopt the official warning for town meeting and Australian ballot vote to be held on March 2 and March 3, 2020, as amended. Second. Is there a discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Move it along. The, well, we did the MOU. Uh, we talked about that, so we're up to manager's report. If I may, there's yes, one please. other motion um, the board may want to consider um, under item 14 that pertain to the charter. It's um, procedural that the town attorney suggested last year. And um, since we're doing a similar thing with the charter this year, the board may want to consider this um, motion as well that the town attorney has suggested. I didn't understand what you said. <laughs> no, the attorney had suggested we pass this motion last year, um, and it oh, pertains to yeah, having it yes. available yes. at the voting booths and, yes. uh, as a matter of procedure. Uh, thank you. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, I remember that motion. <laughs> so 
Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. I'd move to find the charter amendment proposal is too long and unwieldy to be shown in its amended form for each of the separate articles and resolve that copies of the amendment proposal should be readily available to the public, the town offices, and for distribution to those requesting absentee ballots or voting early, if requested, and by having a full copy located at each ballot booth on March 3rd, 2020. Is there a second? Second. Is there a discussion on the motion? If not, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Now we're up to <laughs> manager's <laughs> <Manager's report. laughs> report. So um, I, this is the necessity resolution that was just adopted mo a few moments ago on the bonds. The second page needs to be signed by each board member. The finance report, um, since we have our finance director, uh, maybe I can catch her off guard. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> you want me to give you another minute or two to get ready? Yeah, let's go grab my copy. All right. The, um, I think the only other thing I wanted to touch on is um, the regional dispatch. I met, I gave a, a fairly lengthy update at the board's last meeting. Yes. We had a board meeting this morning and the board agreed that the cost of <clears throat> pulling all the communities together and, and setting up a regional dispatch was um, in the manner that we were studying was um, not workable, it was just too high. So we're going to be looking at other alternatives which might involve a smaller number of municipalities and it might involve not creating a new facility but rather expanding an existing facility, i.e. <clears throat> the city of Burlington. And seeing if there's a mechanism that we can set up, um, still managed by the authority, but as I said, fewer municipalities but less expense. Um, using the infrastructure and, and um, Burlington has to offer. Uh, so that's going to be looked at over the next month or so. And um, uh, now that it may be very likely that that new facility would not be large enough to accommodate towns like Williston. But on the other hand, as it stands now, Williston's interest is somewhat limited, um, partly because, as I said, the cost was high to bring it down they won't have the capacity so we'll have to stick with our current arrangement which was with the uh, for fires with the town of Shelburne and we I don't know I mean the other the bigger piece of our dispatch need is in the police department and there's a um, right now we received as I explained last week I um a lot of free service from the state of Vermont. Now, whether that changes or not remains to be seen. Um, given its election year, it's a, it's kind of a huge issue to be tackling it. But I'm not a politician, so <laughs> I don't know how that's all going to sort itself out. I, I do think eventually the state probably it makes sense to work out some different arrangement than they currently have. But I don't think it's going to happen next year so yeah. that's call it kind of all i have to offer at this point <clears throat> no. okay um eric did you have anything um just briefly there's an update on the health order you issued in october uh, to the bevins property um, town officer has health officers made a couple of visits there um one of the major pieces was addressed last fall regarding the um, the trailers in the backyard, but there there remain some outstanding issues there, and in conjunction with an outstanding zoning order, and um, staff is working with the uh, legal counsel through through these issues still, and we'll keep the board apprised of, of where we get to. Is there a thought about um, <clears throat> going further with legal uh, proceedings on this, or? Yeah, we're we're currently um, looking at those options with with counsel, and we'll. Well, uh, on, on the zoning issue, uh, a, um, a motion has been filed um, because uh, the there's been no appearance um, on the zoning matter from the other side. So, a, 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 you know, a motion in favor of uh, uh, the town is being requested because there's been no opposition. <laughs> so at least that's on the zoning side of things. That's an overall picture thing. That's the lesser of concerns, but we'll, we'll use whatever we have to 
can keep the pressure on to get changes. Yeah. Well, that's all I have. <laughs> so, finance report. <laughs> So these are the um, November year date financial statements. Um, the, in the very first uh, revenue highlight, I just pointed out, even though um, the BEVs and the peak, I just wanted to um, put in dollars the change in that value of the grand list. It's $1,400 in all, and actually it's an increase because of um, the change to the peak property. So even though they look like big numbers in the change of the grand list and the total property tax <clears throat> taxes, it didn't make a huge difference. Um, property taxes, when I look at that and I say, oh, we've already billed them for the year. Why aren't we at 100 percent? We're a little under. And the reason is um, um, for accounting purposes, we get an estimate of the state for what's going to be due to the state and to the schools. And um, in May or early June, we get the actual in Tapley. So we move out of revenue and put into a liability the amount based on the state's estimate. And so when I was working on this year and looking at the year before, that estimate is always high. So towards the end of the school, year I'll be probably moving some funds back into property taxes so those will probably as for the last couple of years be over budget in the end um, some of the revenue is it looks high um, compared to where we are through November but some of them are timing differences like if you look at the rec um, uh, revenue a lot of theirs has already come in from their summer programs and what we recognize through the school year um, is a lot less um, I'm just trying to pick out some of the big ones. Um, highway revenue is over budget. Again, I, I looked at it compared to last year, and it's all the quarry fees for the SD Ireland, and um, there's usually a lot in the fall, summer, fall, and then it'll slide off and not quite as much in the spring when construction starts again. Um, let's see, expenditure highlights. Um, Highway is a, is slightly over um, their budget. They're at 97% of budget, but they um, have expended most of their retreatment budget already for the year. Um, let's see. Um, I think the only other real big expenditure one is the um, town clerk and the treasurer since those those positions were budgeted to be split for the whole year but really it's not going to happen till march so the clerk looks like she's over budget all year but it's because all the salaries year to date are all going to the clerk because we still have the clerk treasurer and then they will be split in march um, so the budget is probably too low for the clerk and, and too high for the new treasurer department so I didn't have any other significant points unless you have questions of me. <clears throat> any questions for Shirley? Sure. Good. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, one other item, I just, uh, or maybe one or two others. Um, just a reminder, February 10th, I think it is, is the um, oh, yeah. date right. for the uh, legislative breakfast. Um, we'll be, um, I, if you haven't sent out, have emails gone out yet? Yep. Um, if all yeah. of the board has the flyer in their packet, if you could, if you could RSVP to me by the fifth, uh, getting a head count for food. Well, that's always important to know how many are coming. Yeah, you did. I did. Okay. Yeah, all right. Excellent. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I said Either as long as my I'll flight's on time, I'll be there. Okay. Sure. We'll need um, Ted. Has in the past has served as the moderator. He will not be there, unfortunately. Uh, so we will need a moderator to do that. It could be any, anyone. <laughs> um, but it probably shouldn't be Terry. Oh, no. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> if Joy, if you're there. Okay. Can you give me lessons first? Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Unless Gordon, if you want this honor, or Jeff, by all means, gentlemen. Thank you. Oh, I, I, the one other item, uh, I'm not quite sure what the, how the board wants to handle this, but um, <clears throat> normally uh, in February, the board does my annual evaluation. 
And this year it feels a little different. Yeah. Yes. So I, I'm not quite sure what the board wants to do with that. But you know, I don't need an answer right now. But <laughs> just a thought. Um, we can think about that at the next meeting. <laughs> uh, I think we can probably have a, a great celebration instead of having <laughs> an evaluation. But. Uh, I like that idea. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Is that it? Okay. Yeah, that's all I had for this evening. So uh, under other business, there we're not having a meeting next week, even though it was scheduled. And, uh, we're not having a meeting next week, okay. next Monday uh, night. So our next meeting will be the first uh, week in February. And uh, hopefully we can, uh, we've had a marathon session here for the last three months, so it's time to Got a little bit of a break anyway. Is there any other business to be brought forward tonight? Well, I, I just thought one more thing. I'm sorry. The um, each I, I think one board member mentioned this earlier. We're going to be doing a flyer just like we always do every year that covers the budget and, and the uh, charter issues. Um, so we'll be doing the same again this year. It'll be like a four-page thing. And I'll, I'll send it around um, for each of you to review before we finalize. We won't have a lot of time bet between when I send it to you and when to, to get it out because it needs to get out to the printer pretty quickly. But yes. Okay. That's it. If there's no other business tonight, then we're adjourned. Thank you.